Hi, I'm Chris Rycroft, and welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. In the previous videos in this series, we introduced numerical quadrature that we can use for numerically integrating functions. So far, our numerical quadrature schemes have been based on rather straightforward choices for quadrature points. Here, we're going to look at a more sophisticated choice that leads to Gauss quadrature that can lead to very good accuracy for numerical integration across a wide range of functions. In previous videos, we showed that we could compare the accuracy of different quadrature schemes by looking at the degree of polynomial that they could integrate exactly. And so far, we haven't been very creative in our choice of quadrature points. We've been looking at newton coates quadrature, where we've just been choosing our quadrature points to be equally spaced over our integration interval. And in this video, we're going to show that we can do better than this, and we're going to maximize the degree of polynomial that we can integrate by specially choosing our quadrature points, the xi. And this will lead to a family of quadrature rules referred to as Gauss quadrature. So if we look at a quadrature scheme where we have n plus 1 quadrature points and n plus 1 associated quadrature weights, then that gives us 2n plus 2 parameters to choose. And therefore, in the best case, we might hope to integrate a polynomial with 2n plus 2 parameters, which would therefore be a polynomial of degree 2n plus 1. And if we were able to do this, this would be a huge improvement on the current situation. With newton coates we're only able to integrate polynomials up to degree n exactly. And therefore, this would result in more than a doubling of the degree of polynomial that we can integrate exactly. However, amazingly, this can actually be achieved. And this leads to Gauss quadrature. And it's really remarkable that we can actually attain this bound and choose these n plus 1 points to get almost double the polynomial degree that we can integrate exactly. So again, the idea is to choose a set of interpolation points and integrate a polynomial interpolant. However, in this case, we'll choose a specific set of interpolation points and our Gaussian quadrature points will be chosen to be the roots of a Legendre polynomial. So the Legendre polynomials, p0, p1, and so on, are a orthogonal polynomial set. And they're orthogonal with respect to a inner product that's defined in terms of integral from minus 1 to 1. And specifically, if we look at the integral from minus 1 to 1 of the product of two Legendre polynomials, pm and pn, then that will be equal to 2 divided by 2m plus 1 if m is equal to n, and 0 otherwise. And the fact that we have this 0 integral for m not equal to n essentially tells us that we have this orthogonality relation. As with Chebyshev polynomials, the Legendre polynomials satisfy a three-term recurrence relation. So we can define that p0 of x is equal to 1, p1 of x is equal to x, and n plus 1 times pn plus 1 of x is equal to 2n plus 1 times x times pn of x minus n times pn minus 1 of x. And I plotted the first six Legendre polynomials in this graph, and you can see that similar to the Chebyshev polynomials, they oscillate over this interval from minus 1 to 1. However, with Chebyshev polynomials, we saw that their minima and maxima achieved equal positions all the time, whereas here we see that the minima and maxima of these polynomials actually vary slightly. Hence, if we wanted to derive the endpoint Gauss quadrature scheme, we could first find the roots of the Legendre polynomial Pn of x, and that would give us our quadrature points, the xi. And we could then integrate the associated Lagrange polynomials, and that would give us our quadrature weights. And for the interval from minus 1 to 1, the Gaussian quadrature rules have been extensively tabulated. And I've listed the points and weights 
for the one point, two point and three point schemes here. And as an example, if we looked at the three point Gauss quadrature scheme, we would have quadrature points that are at minus square root of 3 over 5, 0, and square root of 3 over 5, and associated quadrature weights of 5 ninths, 8 ninths, and 5 ninths. And another key point that we find is that the Gauss quadrature weights are always positive, and therefore we know that Gaussian quadrature will converge as n tends to infinity. And if we now look at the Gauss quadrature points over this interval from minus 1 to plus 1, then we'll see that they tend to cluster towards the ends of the interval. And that therefore helps to control Runge's phenomenon that we would expect with polynomial interpolation if we had equally spaced points. So we'll now take a look in detail at how Gaussian quadrature works and how we can establish this fact that they can integrate polynomials up to degree 2n plus 1 exactly. Let's now look at why Gauss quadrature is so effective at integrating polynomials of a high degree. And as mentioned, Gauss quadrature is based upon Legendre polynomials, and specifically, our Gauss quadrature integration points are chosen to be the roots of a Legendre polynomial. And Legendre polynomials are one example of an orthogonal polynomial set, and much of the reason why Gauss quadrature is so effective derives from these orthogonality properties. And we're therefore going to begin by looking in general at the definitions of orthogonal polynomial sets. So to begin, we can introduce an inner product where for two polynomials p and q, we can define the inner product to be the integral over some range from a to b of p of x times q of x times a weight function w of x dx. And here, the choice of weight function will give us different orthogonal polynomial sets. And for Legendre polynomials, we'll just set w of x to be equal to 1, the constant, but for different choices of w, we could get different orthogonal polynomials. From here, an orthogonal polynomial set is a family of polynomials, u0, u1, u2, and so on, such that for any two distinct entries, uj and uk, their inner product will be equal to 0. And uk will have degree k, and if we look at the set from u0 up to uk, that will form a basis for degree k polynomials. Now, depending on the choice of integration range from a to b and the weight function w, we can end up with different orthogonal polynomial sets. And we're mainly interested then in the Legendre polynomials over the interval from minus 1 to 1 using this constant weight function 1. But if we make some alternative definitions, we can end up with different polynomial sets. For example, we can get the Chebyshev polynomials that we saw in unit 1 using the interval from minus 1 to 1. But in this case, we'd use a weight function equal to 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus x squared. Another example are the Hermite polynomials that are defined on the entire real line, and they make use of a Gaussian weight function. And the Hermite polynomials appear in a number of different situations, including in several areas of probability and also in quantum mechanics. Another choice are the Laguerre polynomials, defined on the interval from 0 to infinity, so the positive real line, and they make use of the weight function of e to the minus x, and the Laguerre polynomials appear in some quantum mechanics calculations. Another definition are the Jacobi polynomials, and they're defined over the interval from minus 1 to 1, and they make use of a weight function of 1 minus x to the alpha times 1 plus x to the beta, and here alpha and beta are parameters. And the Jacobi polynomials are a more general set, and we can see that for specific choices of alpha and beta, we can recover some of our other polynomial families. So, for example, if we put alpha and beta equal to 0, that will give us the Legendre polynomials. And if we put alpha and beta equal to minus a half, that will give us the Chebyshev polynomials. Let's now look in some more detail at Legendre polynomials. So the first few Legendre polynomials are p0 of x is equal to 1, p1 of x is equal to x, p2 of x is equal to a half times 3x squared minus 1, and p3 of x is equal to a half times 5x cubed minus 3x. And as mentioned, if we look at the kth Legendre polynomial, 
then it has degree k. There's a general way that we can calculate Legendre polynomials using Rodriguez formula that says that pk of x is equal to 1 over 2 to the k, k factorial, times the kth derivative of x squared minus 1 to the power of k. And the Legendre polynomials also satisfy the recurrence relation where we can obtain pk plus 1 in terms of pk and pk minus 1. Let's now look at establishing the main result, and we want to show that the n plus 1 point gauss quadrature scheme integrates polynomials up to degree 2n plus 1 exactly. And for maximum generality, we're going to keep our w of x general and our interval of integration from a to b general as well. And we'll write that u0, u1, u2, and so on, are the associated orthogonal polynomials. And we'll be specifically interested in un plus 1, which is the associated orthogonal polynomial of degree n plus 1. Now let's look at a monomial, x to the l, where l is less than n plus 1. And because the orthogonal polynomials form a basis, we can write down that x to the l is equal to the sum from i equals 0 to l of gamma i times ui for some choices gamma i. Now let's look at integrating our monomial x to the l multiplied by un plus 1 and also w. And if we now substitute in our expression for x to the l, then we'll have factors of ui appear in this integral, and we can rewrite this to give us the sum from i equals 0 to l of gamma i times the inner product of ui with un plus 1. And due to the orthogonality relations, we know that all of these inner products will evaluate to 0. And that therefore tells us that this integral is just equal to 0. And since this is true for all monomials, where L is less than n plus 1, we can conclude that any polynomial of degree n multiplied against un plus 1 and w, the integral of this will vanish. Now let's look at applying our quadrature scheme. And we'll write down that x0, x1 up to xn are the roots of our orthogonal polynomial un plus 1 of x. And we'll define associated weights, wk, as equal to the integral from a to b of lk of x, w of x dx. And here, lk is the kth Lagrange polynomial associated with the point xk. Now let's consider a polynomial f of degree at most 2n plus 1. And here we're going to make the key observation. By using long division, we can always express f in the following form. We can write that f of x is equal to p of x times un plus 1 of x plus r of x. And here, p of x and r of x are polynomials of degree at most n. And this form will allow for some dramatic simplifications in some of our subsequent calculations. So let's now write down the exact integral of f. And so here, when we write i of f, we're actually referring to the integral of our function f, also incorporating our weight function w. And if we now write down f in terms of p, u, n plus 1, and r, then we'll get to the following integral. And we'll note here that we have a term p of x times u n plus 1 of x times w of x. And by our previous calculations, since p is degree n polynomial, we know that this will be 0 by the orthogonality relations. And therefore, this integral will just simplify to the integral from a to b of r of x times w of x dx. So we've looked at the exact integral of f. Now let's compare it to the, our quadrature rule applied to f. So if we apply the quadrature scheme, then q of f, that will be equal to the sum from k equals 0 to n of wk times f of xk. And again, we can now expand this out using our specific form of f. So we can say this is sum from k equals 0 to n of wk times p of xk times un plus 1 of xk plus r of xk. And we can now make an observation that un plus 1 of xk actually will vanish because xk has been chosen to be a root of un plus 1. And therefore this sum will simplify just to the sum from k equals 0 to n of wk times r of xk. 
Now let's compare our quadrature scheme to our exact solution. We have that Q of F is equal to the sum from K equals zero to N of W K times R of X K. And we know that R here is a polynomial of degree at most N. And therefore, we know that our quadrature scheme should integrate this polynomial exactly. And this sum will therefore be equal to the integral from A to B of R of X times W of X DX. And on the previous slide, we showed that this was actually just equal to I of F. And that completes our proof. We can see here then that the quadrature scheme is exact for all polynomials up to degree 2n plus 1. And if we look at how this works, it's really following from the fact that these higher order terms, the terms in this polynomial P, drop out due to those orthogonality relations. And that is why we can more than double the order of polynomial that we can integrate exactly. So here we've established Gauss quadrature for the case when our weight function w of x is equal to 1 and our integration region is from a to b, but the steps that we're taking here could now generalize to different orthogonal polynomial sets. We've now seen why Gauss quadrature can integrate polynomials up to degree 2n plus 1 exactly. And in this derivation, we relied on the orthogonality relations of the Legendre polynomials. And throughout the derivation, we kept around this weight function, w of x. And for Legendre polynomials, we just set this w to be equal to 1. However, it's worth noting that for different choices of w, we can derive alternative useful quadrature schemes. And suppose that we're interested in integrals of the form from minus 1 to 1 of w of x times f of x dx, where now f is a polynomial. So if we wanted to derive a quadrature scheme for integrals of this type, then we could first look at the orthogonal polynomial set that is orthogonal with respect to an inner product where we now incorporate this weight function, the w. And if our orthogonal polynomial set is given by uj for this case, then we could derive effective quadrature schemes based on the roots of these polynomials uj. And as one example, let's consider the case when w of x is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And in this case, our orthogonality relation between uj and uk would therefore read as the integral from minus 1 to 1 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared times uj of x times uk of x dx. And we'll actually see that the Chebyshev polynomials satisfy this orthogonality relation. And to see this, let's try putting uj of x is equal to tj of x which we can define as the cosine of j times the inverse cosine of x. And now let's look at the inner product between tj of x and tk of x. So this will be equal to the integral from minus 1 to 1 of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared cosine times j of the inverse cosine of x times cosine of k times the inverse cosine of x dx and we can now make a variable substitution. We can put that x is equal to cosine theta. And in this case, we'll get the integral from 0 to pi of 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus cosine squared theta times cosine j theta, cosine k theta, and then a sine theta d theta due to the variable substitution. And we'll see that we have two sine thetas that cancel away here and we're left with the integral from 0 to pi of cosine j theta, cosine k theta, d theta. And this is now a Fourier orthogonality relation. And we know that tj and tk, the inner product of these two, will be 0 if j is not equal to k by our Fourier orthogonality relations. And that then establishes that the Chebyshev polynomials are the orthogonal polynomial set that we're looking for in this case. Hence, the roots of a Chebyshev polynomial could be used to construct a quadrature formula 
for this choice of W. And this is just one example of a generalization to Gauss quadrature. And it's actually useful for us to compare the Cherishev and Legendre based quadrature schemes. And let's look now at plotting the fifth polynomials for Chebyshev and Legendre. And in both cases, we can see that the roots of these polynomials are clustered towards the ends of the integration interval. However, we can see that for Chebyshev, the clustering is slightly stronger. And this is consistent with the weight function that we used. If we look at our function w of x, which is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, then this will increase towards the ends of the interval. And therefore, it makes sense that the associated quadrature rule would place more weighting on the ends of the interval. Gauss quadrature and associated quadrature rules are widely used in scientific computing and are incorporated into many scientific software libraries. I previously demonstrated the quad routine in Python for performing integration, and this makes use of Plenshaw-Curtis quadrature that is based on Chebyshev polynomials. In Plenshaw-Curtis quadrature, we don't have the property that we can integrate polynomials up to degree 2n plus 1 exactly, as we do in Gauss quadrature. However, it's been shown that in real-world cases, Clenshaw-Curtis quadrature is often as effective as Gauss quadrature. In MATLAB, there are two functions called quad and quad L for integration. Quad makes use of an adaptive Simpson rule, and quad L makes use of Gauss-Lobato quadrature. In Gauss-Lobato quadrature, we take our usual Gauss quadrature points, and we also add in additional points at the ends of the interval at plus or minus one. And because the ends of the interval are shared between neighboring intervals in a composite quadrature scheme, incorporating them can actually improve accuracy while allowing us to share a function evaluation between two different integration subintervals. And gauss lobato quadrature typically works well for smooth integrands. Recently, in MATLAB, the quad and quad L functions have been superseded by the integral function that can work over a wide variety of cases.